Let's begin with prayer. Your Father in heaven, we pray that you grant us your Holy Spirit so that we may not read the account of Israel at the time of the judges with self-righteous hearts, but acknowledge our own weakness and our own propensity to worship the idols of our own hearts. Help us to always place our trust in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the, when we finished off in the third chapter, verse uh, 6, last week, uh, the summation of this period is that the Lord uh, had left because of the, this is very important, and I know that psychologically it doesn't make sense to us, but this is the way God works. Because the children of Israel were weak in their faith, they did not carry through with the destruction of the enemies in Canaan the way the Lord commanded them. The Lord doesn't force us. He draws us through the gospel. If we uh, do not are not drawn by the gospel to obey his word of faith and his grace and promises, he doesn't force us to do what he knows is right for us. He could have easily gone in there with, uh, you know, one angel and wiped out all the Canaanites for the Israelites and they wouldn't have had to lift a sword. But that's not how he works. He said, I'm going to be with you and I want you now to act on this promise of my word. When we fail to act, we suffer. And he's not going to pick up the pieces and make things work the way he would like them to work by force. Uh, uh, not by the law, which is the principle most people operate by, uh, and not by force of arms. So um, it says in verse 4 of chapter 3, he allows uh, some of these Sidonians and Hivites and, and so on to live in the land uh, to test Israel, to know whether Israel will obey the commandments of the Lord. Now what was the commandments? All of the law, and also the command to keep rooting out these heathen. So they were to keep on the job that they started when they destroyed Jericho uh, under Joshua. So the people of Israel lived uh, among the Canaanites, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. This is where we left off last week. And I pointed you to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Uh, verses 1 through 8, where Moses made this prediction. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgasites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, Hivites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than yourselves. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. That was the original command. And already uttered uh, in the days of Moses. Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You see a, a, a cute little uh, a child of the Hivites? You run the sword through his heart. And we talked last week about how difficult that would do. Test of faith. You think the tests of faith that you go through are difficult? Imagine that. You shall not intermarry with them. But this Jebusite woman is gorgeous. What am I to do? I'm head and heels in love with her. Or so I think. There is no beauty like that in Israel. I've got to have that Jebusite woman. Run her through with a sword. Or ask forgiveness. No. 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 That comes from the human heart. <laughs> we, we, don't, we, we don't look ahead and take advantage. That's called cheap grace. This whole thing about, uh, you know, the saying that human beings use, I can, ask, I can do it and ask for forgiveness later. That's cheap grace. That's not faith. Uh, there's no faith in that. That's uh, mocking God, actually. Shame on you, Don. <laughs> yeah, okay. You ask forgiveness. Then he says, uh, 
Don't intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Does anybody have the word will instead of would? All right. Is there a difference? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, there's a difference. There's a difference, isn't there? will do. Yeah. So the one says something about the purpose of these heathen people. That they desire to turn your heart away from the true God. So deep inside them is this, this desire to, to change your faith. Don't, therefore, don't marry them. Uh, that's the wood. I prefer the will. It's difficult sometimes to tell in the Hebrew. You have to go by the context. But, but the will it doesn't get into the motivation. Now, I don't buy that. I've been in the ministry too long to buy that every unbeliever wants to convert the Christian to unbelief. I don't believe that. If they really uh, uh, care for, I'm talking about Christians now marrying unbelievers. Remember I promised you last week you get to answer that question, whether that's good or bad, or indifferent. <coughs> so I, I didn't forget that. I, that's why I wanted to go back and before we go on. But Will says, God is prophesying this is what's going to happen, which to me fits the biblical context better. He's, he's not saying that this is what their, their purpose and design is, but they will. It'll end up that way. And that way you can speak in a generality. Uh, generally speaking, this is what they will do. In other words, you, your heart will be turned away from the true God to worship the heathen gods by these marriages that you enter into. But that's not a categorical doctrinal thing. It's an exegetical question whether it's would or will. Uh, I prefer will. Moses prophesies this in Deuteronomy. What happened back there before the flood? You recall? Chapter 6, verse 1. When man began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Anybody have a question? Why doesn't it say the daughters of, of, of God saw that the men of man were attractive? Why does it say the son, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive? Did it work the other way or not? Was it just these, uh, these weak men who were believers that uh, took of the women of the unbelievers? Or were there believing women who took unbelieving men? That's a tough one, huh? Why do you suppose that the, the sons of God are singled out? You know the answer to this. Think about it. Why does it say the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were attracted? Biology. And men naturally, generally speaking, are more easily attracted by what they see. Whereas the woman is not. With the woman it's more she's attracted by not necessarily what they see so much as what they feel. Think about it. That's why so many women want the sensitive man. Right? We talked about that. Just don't get too sensitive, guys. Be like those those boys there at the Columbia Bible College that are feeding each other on the picnic tables. Boys feeding boys because the professors at Columbia Bible College are teaching that this is how we teach sensitivity to males. We feed one another. I wasn't visiting the campus. I got that from Eric and Kristen. So uh, here you go. This is, this is something that has, that has been a plague since the fall of the sin. The sexual attraction why is that such a powerful influence? Biology, right? We're made that way. And so if the devil is going to appeal, when you look at all the ancient heathen religions, last week we talked about Baal and Ashtoreth. Baal was the male fertility god, Ashtoreth was the female, and you see them together. They're coupled in these verses. They follow the Baalim and the Ashtoreth. The fertility god and goddess, this, is, this runs throughout heathendom, all the way up to the time of Christ, to the, to the congregation in Corinth, where the men, Paul has to warn, careful when you go down to the city, because those priestesses that serve these uh, heathen gods of the Corinthians, they try to seduce you. Sex has always played a major role in heathen cultic religion. 
It's that way all over the world. Look at the Muslims. Why don't they treat the woman the way they ought to? They have no respect for her. She's, uh, she's like, was it Van Halen? I hate rock music, but this, this particular one, they had a horrible, horrible piece where they referred to a woman as a grade A US, US beef, as a piece of meat. What was the name of that group? Van Halen, not Van Halen. That was horrible. Women were regarded as a piece of meat to be used. That's the way the Muslims think. Uh, and, sure, and, what, a Snoop Dogg or something? No, what, a Snoop Dogg. We can't blame that on him. All right, so this was the issue. It had been from the fall into sin. In numbers, you remember when Israel had crossed and they, they began to come across from the Red Sea into the wilderness in those early years, Balaam, the prophet, was going to be used by Balak, the king of the Moabites, to curse Israel. And every time uh, a Balak, the king, would ask Balaam to curse Israel, Balaam would consult God, and God said, no, you can't curse my people. And so Balaam would go back and tell Balak, I can't curse God's people. And in the end, when it all failed, then the plan was, we'll try to interest the Israelite men in the Moabite women. And that's how they got them to fall. So, always been a problem. Therefore, the Christian shall not marry a heathen. True or false? Practical question. I've had to face it in ministry. Now you've got to face it. What do you tell somebody? What if a pastor says to you that it's a sin for the Christian to marry an unbeliever? Doesn't it say be not unequally yoked with unbelievers? Can't you do that? No. Because the context where that passage is found, where Paul's talking to the Corinthians, uh, quoting from, from the Old Testament, I think from Deuteronomy, from the law, be not unequally yoked to unbelievers, the way Paul uses that passage in that context is talking about false teachers. He's not talking about marital relations, but he's saying, don't be in the company of, in the support of, uh, false teachers. True or false? It's a sin to marry an unbeliever. Hey, why? What does Paul say about keeping company? We have to be aware of the companions that we keep. That certainly applies to marriage. You're living with this companion all your life. If, you, if, if there's a warning in Scripture that you're, the company you keep can influence, influence you and, and uh, I think the word is uh, cause bad manners, leads to bad manners, which is a kind of way of saying a bad life. If that can come just from your acquaintances, uh, certainly it'll come from cohabiting with, with somebody day after day and being under their influence. So, yeah, what was the concern that Abraham had when he sent uh, his servant out to find a, a mate? That's one job he was supposed to pick from, wasn't it? Yeah, he didn't want him to pick from the people of, of, of Canaan. He knew what kind of people they were. So he sent him off to Haran to, to, to marry his cousin, uh, which was okay in those days. You could do that. So there's plenty of, of, of example from Scripture that this is not a wise thing. But we can't make a law of it.